So I just I I lost for words there because the BMW that just came on to the roundabout as I was coming on to the roundabout was indicating. I didn't actually know they were fitted with indicators. Hello and welcome back to another video. It's been a while, but I've been putting this the Honda CRV through its paces. Here we are about two and a half thousand miles later. Been up to Edinburgh a couple of times, as you know, once, and Devon, and then the daily drive around as well has has added up to two and a half thousand miles. Similar to what I had in my previous car when I did a revised review. Once I found out what it was really like. Terrible, but in this case, it has been a fairy tale instead of a nightmare. It's actually it's been it's exceeded expectations, and as you can see, as with my other reviews, lovely day, overcast, rain on the window. I was actually waiting today for the rain to stop, so I didn't have to have the window wipers on making noise, and I could actually go outside. So a little bit more in depth than my last video it was. Wasn't too dramatic, was it? This is a 2.2 litre diesel Honda CRV, about 150 horsepower, 250 foot pound of torque. When I bought this, I was quite lucky. I couldn't see any evidence of a tow bar ever being on this car, which is probably one of the only CRVs in the country that hasn't. You buy them used with one, people attach them immediately. Sometimes people don't even want to buy one without a tow bar already attached to it. They are incredible for towing catering units, caravans, trailers. They're the go-to, especially sort of sub, well, 5,000 pounds. The MPG hasn't been too bad. It's been 45 miles per gallon, which is better than I think about 42, which is the official figures for combined. So yeah, 45 MPG, I've been it's been pretty good. This car's just been very, very looked after. And I think that's what's getting the higher MPGs. It's had the best oil, the best diesel service every single year. I'm only the third owner. It's only done 65,000 miles for a diesel. Pretty much nothing, just worn in. And it feels that way. The steering's just so sharp, direct. Not overly sharp like a Ferrari, but just you can feel the road, but it's also not like driving a tractor around a corner. That's the funny thing. I think that horsepower on this, 150, sounds quite low for a car like this, or a car in general. It sounds quite low, in my opinion. But it's the torque where it really kicks in. I mean, you can pretty much overtake almost in any gear, to be honest. I just That overtake I just did, it wasn't very extreme. That was in sixth gear. If you really needed to, drop it down a gear, you can overtake anything in this car. I mean, I've worried in other cars that I've owned, but in this, it's not a concern in the slightest. The seats are very comfortable, you've got lots of adjustment here, the lumbar support. You've got, you know, it's all electric on this seat only, privileged seat. And as I'm driving, the weather's getting worse again. Of course it is. This car's big enough. I've been very tempted this year, if it wasn't the worst summer and July on record, in the top six, officially. Worst, rainiest, July. Hopefully September and, uh, well, hopefully half of August. August, September, October will be fairly nice. This car, I believe, is easily big enough to put at least a camp or a military-style camp bed in the back, I would think. So, say, necessarily having to get a tent. I might want to if it's too hot, but lay a bed roll in the back of this. Camper van, caravan, camping, tent have a little gas stove. I think this would be a great car for this overlander. And on my journeys, having the four wheel drive, I think that helps with the torque figure because it's got the pulling power, you've got, got the grip. You're not attaching a caravan that's so heavy that the front wheels are just spinning. This. 
Audi RS3 level of acceleration. Maybe not top speed. <laughs> but it has, this has been more, more than I could have asked for this car, honestly. I'm so happy with it. It's got the best gear shifter I think I've had in any other car other than perhaps my other Civics. I think Hondas make the best manual gearboxes. Absolutely, 100%, no questions asked. It's almost like an automatic in the sense that you don't even realise you're changing it. It's so easy, so swift, so, so precise. There's no giving it. I'm gonna do a bit of an acceleration test now. As a load of black soot comes out. It does, it does. There's no DPF in this, so, sorry. Everyone, I think everyone's just choked to death in the background. Anyway, I've been super impressed. There's a few rattles in the cabin. Now, it might just be what the contents of the glove box or the wiring that I've done for my dash cam. But there is a, there's a few rattles that I've just thought, mm, they shouldn't really be there, especially for this age. Well, the age, yes, but the mileage, no. It's just a little bit, bit annoying. But otherwise, everything else, seating position, perfect. Well, you can easily achieve the perfect seating position. Now, what are the alternatives to this sort of car? Well, you have the Toyota RAV4, I suppose. Nissan X-Trail. <laughs> Nissans aren't the most reliable Japanese car you can buy, and Toyota is. But the RAV4 had issues, particularly with the diesel engines, weirdly, because you'd think that the diesel variants would be the most the pop, most popular, but I think it's just a little bit hit and miss. I think the later ones got better, they didn't burn so much oil, I think that was one of the main problems. But no, some of the, I think it was the 2.2 .2 diesel RAV4s had catastrophic engine issues, same as the 2.2 .2 CX-5s. I was actually looking at the CX-5s, I like them. I think the interior quality and the presentation, just look at them, is better, really. I, mean, like, I think you get real leather as opposed to, I think this is artificial. But yeah, just the diesel RAV4 and CX-5. Too many horror stories, unfortunately. If you get the CX-5, you want to go for the 2-litre petrol. The RAV4, probably just wait for the later version, like 1.6 RAV4, or in fact, one of the hybrids. So would I recommend this car? Absolutely yes. I don't know whether I should do my little rating system out of five. I'd probably give it four. I don't know, as a car, probably five. I mean, you can't really go wrong with this car. The MPG's been fine. Reliability, I have no issues with. I'm, I'm sure I could put another 100,000 miles on this car, no problem, with a yearly service. I think it's the first car I've had in a long, long time, if not ever, that's got four matching tyres. What are they? Dunlop, I think. The audio quality of the speakers, not the best. You sort of get used to it, as with any car, once you've, like, when you listen to something for a long time, it starts sounding okay. But yeah, this, this car is quite well specced. I mean, it's got automatic lights, automatic window wipers. It's got heated, I think it's got heated wing mirrors as well. Yep, yeah, it does heated wing mirrors. Folding electric wing mirrors. Don't like this infotainment system. The biggest is issue is sometimes you just want to just bloody turn it off and not have any light. Because even with the backlight on, with the screen, it's still light when you're driving at night time. So luckily I found out if you press the little daytime, nighttime button like two or three times, it goes brighter, dims it, then it turns it off. That's all, there might be another way to turn it off completely, but you know, on and off doesn't turn the screen off, it's more standby. And there's just the navigation and finding stuff, and the, I mean, who uses inbuilt sat navs these days? No one. But down here in, in my nice little cupboard, auxiliary, which is fantastic, and three cigarette lighters, or power outlets as they call them now, in this car. One underneath the gear stick, which is in a really nice position, the gear stick, like a racing car, not very far from the steering wheel, no sort of going down here. Love it, more cars should have it up here, like the Honda Civics. Don't know what this aircraft thruster handbrake's all about, but it's quite cool, I guess. 
heated seats on both, low, which seems to do nothing. I don't know whether I'd feel it more in the winter, in that maybe it's just kind of an ambient temperature. And warm, that does work very well, like a standard seat heater. And the other power outlets are one in this cupboard, so that's quite good. You can charge your phone up in the cupboard and have it right shut out, out the way. You can have your dash cam running, if you haven't hardwired it, like I probably should. And then there's one also in the boot, which is good for inflating a dinghy while on holiday, or a dinghy while on holiday, or a, a tyre inflator, or something else like that, or a mini fridge, or a TV and a PlayStation while you go camping, because that's not ruining the immersion, is it, at all? This suspension is not that soft. It's actually quite jarring I think that helps around the corners and helps you sort of yeah have a sportier feel I wouldn't call this car sporty it has a powerful feel to it but it's not it's not sporty sort of fun it's not the steering here this is heavy steering and fairly firm suspension so it's probably better than say <laughs> a c4 cactus but probably not as sporty as a cx5 which I don't know. Some people say that's a little bit too firm for the majority of people, which it probably is. I haven't really bought this car to be a sports car, but it is nice to feel what you're doing. Some cars that are just so numb. I, in personal experience, think it's actually quite dangerous having too numb of a car. But the CRV, would I recommend it? Absolutely. I got this quite cheap, but so I would say for a really good one of this era, or maybe sort of up to 2010, this is 2007, so it's fairly. The, it's the year it came out, so it's amazing. They got it first, right, first time. Most most of the time, with cars, especially the first generation, or when it's just come out the first year, had all sorts of recalls and things. But Honda, sixty-five thousand miles. This will still be going at one hundred sixty-five thousand miles, and it's the sort of car that if I get another car, hint hint, I could potentially see myself just keeping this and putting it in a garage and declaring it sawn and then, you know, if I ever wanted to convert it into a little overlander camper or just use it for going up to Lake, Lake District or something. I got it, it's such a good it's such a good price for this car. But yeah, for this car, maybe up to 2010, 6,000 pounds, probably get you a really good one. You're sort of looking 10,000 for the next generation for a decent two litre diesel, 1.6 litre diesel. I don't, I know some people say that petrol makes sense, but you're better looking for a crossover, I think, if you just want a city car. I mean, I wouldn't buy this car just for driving around a city or a town. It's just too big, too much. You just don't need it, it's over the top, especially like 4x4 and that. This is good, a very, very popular car in Scotland and in Devon, I've noticed, for obvious reasons. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe. That's the main thing that's going to help me at the moment as I ramp this up. I'm going to try and bring the um, frequency of these videos up again. It was nice to have a little trial at the end of last year, beginning of this year. But now, now I've got a car I'm happy to travel in, go to car meet, review cars, more cars. join me on this adventure but yes thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time very soon hello and welcome back to another video the hell intro was that you just feel the wheel sort of moving underneath you that's what happens in cars 